what is social justice because today's terminology or definition of social justice has taken on a different direction altogether not to share our own riches with the poor is robbery uh, we want to do so many big things and we find ourselves paralyzed not knowing how to do these things but in reality all i have to do is, is to start small what's the way that you see us fighting for justice but doing it in a civil manner in a in a in a christ-like manner you just reversed the whole definition by the way because because social justice today means my rights where are my rights but what you're saying is i have responsibilities towards the other and are you hopeful are you hope are you seeing it is it becoming more difficult i see it all the time i see it everywhere mm. that's who you must love mm. that's who you must help that's that's your neighbor and it's because of him that you could then inherit eternal life. Welcome back to the COA podcast. Today we have the blessing of having Father Gabriel with us again. But today we have something very special. We have a very special guest, the first non-clergy guest on the COA podcast, and that's Nermin Riyad, the founder of and ex what's the official title? It's founder and... Executive director. Executive director. Forgive me. I'm going to probably get that wrong a lot. The founder and executive director of Coptic Orphans. She's been doing that for 36 years, and she's had the blessing of impacting over 86,000 lives. So then you'll ask me, what is the topic of today? The topic of today is one that is a bit sometimes politically charged. It's two words that sometimes rub people the wrong way, but we want to do it a little differently, and that's social justice. And when we speak about social justice for our podcast, we don't mean the social justice that you hear in the news. We mean the social justice that we heard in St. James' Epistle when he says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. We hope that at the end of the podcast today, we all come out with a zeal, a zeal for our brothers and sisters all around the world, those who are less fortunate, those who are oppressed, those who are experiencing any injustices. And I think we have the perfect guest today to help us light that fire underneath us. So right off the bat, Nermeen, I'll give you the hard question first, and then we'll go into the, the funner questions. But what is true social justice? Um, thank you, Paul, for having me, and thank you, thank you Father uh, Gabriel, for being here, that or to be here with you. Um, true social justice, true social justice, actually. Um, it's clearly uh, defined in, uh, in the biblical text, and I think one of the, the best uh, parables that shows exactly what it means to have social justice. Actually, there are two that I think are incredibly important. The first is um, the rich man and Lazarus. And uh, St. John Chrysostom on, in the book on wealth and poverty um, has uh, an incredible um, explanation of it. If I may, can Please. I read yeah. the, um, what, the, uh, what he has written? So, um, uh, the beginning of the parable, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar man named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and he went to Hades. So St. John Chrysostom asks, why did the rich man go to hell? He did no harm to Lazarus, right? He never beat him. Mm. He never insulted him. Uh, present day would be he never threatened to sue him for trespassing. Mm. The only reason that he went to hell was that he failed to share his wealth. Mm -hmm. And this is... Um, St. John goes on to say, this is a cruelty. Uh, this cruelty is the worst kind of wickedness. It is an inhumanity without rival for one who enjoys such luxury to neglect others who are wasting away from hunger. Then he adds to this and he says, 
Not to share our own riches with the poor is robbery of the robbery of the poor and the depriving them of their livelihood. And that which we possess is not only our own, but also theirs. This is what justice means. It means to share your wealth with the poor. This is what justice means. Mm. So this is the first one. Mm -hmm. Second parable, even greater. Why? Because it relates to this concept of oppressed, oppressor, and this is more the, the political part of social justice. But here, Christ gives us the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what makes this so remarkable, it's this is a story of the oppressed helping the oppressor. Mm. So, as we know, the Jews hated the Samaritans. They wouldn't drink from the same cup as a Samaritan. They considered them worse than pagans. And so you have the man that was robbed and left for dead. And the first man, the first is the priest, and he comes by and he crosses over to the other side. The Levi also crosses over. I mean, he's also a Jew, just like them. But no, he, you know, they don't, they don't stop to help. And I, and I don't blame them. Do you know why? Because the road to Jericho is actually a very dangerous road. And so the, the robbers could still be around. They could, this man could be setting them up and he's going to attack them himself. Um, and so Martin Luther King, uh, in his last speech before he was assassinated, um, expands on this parable and he says, so the first question that the priest asks, the first question that the Levi asks was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? So the Samaritan the hated man had compassion on the man who often oppressed him. And this is what Christ calls us to do. Basically, you want me to have compassion on those who oppress me? And the answer is yes. Yeah. This is justice. I was going to ask you another question, but I just felt convicted. I don't know why when you were reading that, it made me think, Whenever something goes wrong, we're always used to saying, why me or why God? But when we're given blessings or riches, we never say, why me, why mm. God? And in like terms, if it is why me, then I should be giving it to those who don't, you know? Mm. We never ask why me when it's a blessing or, or a gift. And that, that's, that's, I don't know, it just hit me for some reason. So let me ask you. Before we get into the important meaty stuff, people who tell you it's overcharged with politics, social justice is all politics, or you know those who do good, they do it for a photo op, or those who do good, they do it so that they can be seen. What is your, what is your reply to them? Uh, my reply is to really not so much listen and, <laughs> and to keep on going. When you are working in this field, when you're working for justice, I mean, when you see injustices and it burns you, i.e. children who may not have an opportunity for education, or girls being pulled out of school for early marriage. When these things happen, this is what you're focusing on. And day after day, you work towards that. And so though the naysayers, the uh, S. Churchill says, you know, you'll never get anywhere if you stop to throw stones at every do dog that barks. You just keep on going. Um, and 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 I think it's also important, uh, a lot of times we confuse um, these concepts, right? Uh, uh, but we don't want to fall in love with a certain concept, you know, social justice, to the detriment of helping the poor and loving your neighbor. So, um, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky uh, in the Brothers Karamazov has a lovely, lovely story. If I may read it, Tamim. 
Um, he says, the more I love humanity in general, the less I love man in particular. In my dreams, I often make plans for the service of humanity, and perhaps I may actually face crucifixion if it were suddenly necessary. Yet I am capable of living in the same room with anyone for two days together. I know from experience, as soon as anyone is near me, his personality disturbs me and restricts my freedom. In 24 hours, I begin to hate the best of men. One, because he's too long over his dinner. Another, because he has a cold and he keeps blowing his nose. I become hostile to people the moment they come close to me. But it has always happened that the more I hate men individually, the more I love humanity. It's often we are um, convicted or we fall into that trap where we want to help theoretically all of humanity. Mm. But we forget that justice is face to face. It's touching. It's, um, it's personal. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes too, we, we forget that that one soul is worth an infinite amount, right? So, so it's not about changing the world, right? But, but taking care of that one soul in the eyes of God is just has so much value because the soul is infinite created in the image of God. So, so I absolutely agree that sometimes uh, we want to do so many big things and we find ourselves paralyzed, not knowing how to do these things. But in reality, all I have to do is, is to start small, right? Exactly. And I, I think I think your your own story was something similar to this, right? So you had, you didn't start with something that was huge, right? Can you tell us a bit about that? If you had told me, I, I mean, as Paul had said, uh, mm -hmm. that I'd be running an organization that's going to reach eighty six thousand children with five offices around the world and one hundred and sixty mm -hmm. some staff members, I'd go, what? What mm -hmm. does that mean? I wouldn't have even understood it. But in truth, um, um. Very similar to uh, the the Good Samaritan being on the road to Jericho and finding someone in my path. That's where God is telling you to start, mm. whoever he sends to you on, in your path. And so who did God send to me on my path? It was 45 girls in a, a small orphanage in Cairo. And they were the beginning of the, the children that I met face to face. And in the past, I was sponsoring a child from a, through another organization. And then it suddenly dawned on me, wait a minute, why am I sponsoring some child far away in another country when I see them, these girls, directly in front of me? And so we did the same thing that the other organization was doing. The, the stories of the children and getting, becoming, and knowing their, uh, their history, et cetera. And from those 45 children, as you said, today, 86,000 children mm -hmm. by God's grace uh, that have been touched and have been helped in some way or another, who have gotten an education, who have beaten the injustices that they were born into, um, all by God's grace. And so mm -hmm. start small yeah. and God will make it grow. Forgive mm -hmm. me, you told us a story earlier before we started filming and I'm, I'm going to make you tell it to everyone again because people sometimes are skeptical. They tell you, you know, it's a cash grab or a business or these are pictures of kids that don't even exist or no one actually helps them. But you were telling us stories, beautiful stories of, of those same children coming full circle and them being the ones to sponsor. So can you tell us that story again? So uh, a young man, a lovely young man who his father passed away when he was only seven years old, small village, uh, a very, a very humble area. Um, and it would be very difficult for him to become anything. And yet, by the grace of God, his hard work and the support of Coptic orphans, he went on to graduate high school, go on to get a scholarship in one of the, uh, Egypt's prestigious universities, became a software engineer, um, is now working at uh, at um, Starbucks as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. He attended one of our galas, told his story to a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. and, and then at the end, he came and he sponsored a child. So now he's donating every month, um, supporting a child. And um, yes, it does come full circle. And I'm mm -hmm. so proud of him. It's beautiful. <laughs> and Father, actually both of you were telling me before, because we were discussing, you know, to people who don't know, you know, or are new to the faith, they're like, why the poor? 
why even you know worry about the poor i I can barely worry about myself we hear that a lot okay Mm -hmm. and you're both telling me the figurehead of our faith of our existence the creator of the universe chose poverty so if you can again just it's very beautiful the way you put it father tell us no i was just saying how how christ himself when he chose to become human to save and to heal humanity he chose to be like all the marginalized drugs he he became extremely poor to the point that he was uh, born in a manger had no place to to sleep in the inn um you know he, he was born next to the animals and whatnot and throughout his life he suffered a lot uh, did not own clothes did not have even a bed or a pillow to sleep on, right? Um, so, so Christ really chose to go down at the lowest level of humanity to raise all of us up, right? Together with him. And therefore it becomes a responsibility to us as well, or for us to continue Christ's work while we are here on earth. And then Nermini would mention also about the cross if you wanna develop on that. Uh... Yes, um, as Christ was here, um, and he began to associate himself with these very marginalized groups, these groups that never got justice historically, the poor, the women and children, uh, uh, slaves, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, the ultimate association, and, and so how he did that was by saying, I was hungry and you gave me food, I was naked and you clothed me. But really the ultimate association was his choice to to die as a uh, um, at the death of a criminal, mm-hmm. tortured yeah. and humiliated. The worst. He um, he totally associated himself with with these people, and so um, so his statement was basically: there is no more exclusion. No one is shunned. He's accepting all, and in in doing that, he sealed the the fact that we each of us are created in the image of God, each and every one of us in the image of God Himself, mm-hmm. and with that comes great dignity. And this is what He's saying to us: in in when I'm seeing a poor person, I I have to see the image of God in him. Mm-hmm. I have to treat him with the dignity that comes with being a created, being a son of God. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I would argue as well, like in Matthew 25, when he has the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left hand, which you referenced earlier, um, he's speaking, both both groups are Christians, actually, if you notice, because even the goats on the left hand are telling him like, Lord, when did we see you and not do this? So they have faith in him. They call him Lord. And, you know, the implication is, is if I have seen you, Mm. I would have done it, mm. right? And then we know the, the end uh, and how it goes, but my point here is that there is a calling for us to follow in his footsteps because he's telling me, he's telling you, he's telling Paul, telling the audience that you do like I have done. You know, did you visit the, you know, the, the sick? Did you feed the hungry? Did you mm. give drink to the thirsty? Did you visit those who are in prison? So it becomes, he's passing this duty along to us. So like you said earlier, it is a must for us to follow in Christ's footsteps. I think something that breaks my heart a lot is when Christianity is almost used as as the religion of, in some, you know, the rich or as, you know, the, the Western countries are the Christian countries and they don't know what's happening across the world. And you just said the words that Christ came for the marginalized. Mm. He came as poor for the poor. Mm. You know, he, he he was tried as a criminal for criminals. He mm. was, you know, in all things, mm. he took the the least possible image he could. Mm. So it breaks my heart almost to see Christianity be labeled as that when it's completely the opposite, that that's what Christ is and was and, yeah. and still is today. But that's that's what Philippians two is all about, right? That mm. Christ emptied himself from all this glory, and he was clothed with humility, right? Rode on the donkey instead of the cherubim, right? He died the worst type of death. And he endured it even to the death of the cross for our sakes. This is Christianity, right? Mm. And so again, it is a must for us to do it.
So that takes me actually to the next question for both of you. It's a tough one, sorry, and I'm probably coming out of nowhere, but there is no social justice without Christ, mm. and there is no Christ without social justice. Mm-hmm. Can you please explain that to everyone so that they can understand more of that mystery? Go sorry, for it. it's a tough go one. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we have to make a, a, a big distinction between humanitarian work and Christian work, meaning s- true social justice will always have Christ and the Creator at its foundation. And it's a work that is full of the presence of God. So it's not only about like necessarily feeding the poor. Yeah, I'm feeding the poor, you know, uh, bread, and giving them water, but I'm also feeding them spiritually. There is the presence of Christ that is there that is doing this work. So it's not just a humanitarian type of work that is done outside of Christ because there are other things that come along with that, which what, like you you mentioned earlier in the first question, what is social justice? Because today's terminology or definition of social justice has taken on a different direction altogether. Mm-hmm. There are many things that we attach or we couple with social justice today that are not really social justice. It's not how Christ would do it. So as Christians, we have to come back always to God and wonder, well, should I listen or believe or do just as I'm being told by the world? Or there are certain things that don't follow certain Christian standards. Um, and if I am Christian, if this is who I am, if this is my identity, that then this guides and pushes everything that I do in this world. So to do proper social justice, it has to be done in Christ. He has to be the foundation. We have to follow his commandments. We do not renegotiate uh, what humanity is, but we follow again in his footsteps, yeah. How can you have love without love himself, right? Absolutely. If he is love, how can we love our brother and sister without him? Yeah. But Nermin, I'll ask you the opposite side of that now. Christianity without the poor or Christianity without social justice is impossible, right? Well, you Here's a, a remarkable statement. I cannot find salvation without my brother. Mm. Mm. So why would I say something like that? Um, the, the young man, the, the lawyer who came to Christ, and he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Christ asked him, says, what's your reading of it? And he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your strength and your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Christ said, yep, that's it. That's it. Go for it. Go ahead and do that. And then the lawyer goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But who is my neighbor? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? And so the story of the, the Good Samaritan. And so Christ at the end, he asks him, so who was then neighbor to, to the man? Uh, and the young man said, the one who had compassion on him. Mm-hmm. And he says, yes, go and do likewise. So why did he? Uh, mention and love the neighbor as yourself. You know, in other words, Christ could have uh, could have said, "No, no, that's it." You know, love your God, and that's it. But no, he insisted. You know, it, you know, the the man mentioned uh, the neighbor, and Christ said, "Yes, that's that's correct." Yes, but who's my neighbor? He explained to him, "This is my neighbor." So what Christ is saying, mm. without having compassion on your neighbor, will you inherit eternal life? Mm. something to think about Mm -hmm. so is my neighbor in this case only the Christians it's whomever God Mm -hmm. puts in your path excellent because like the Samaritan and the Jews are not friends here right absolutely so so as a Christian as a Coptic Christian whatever background I have my neighbor means the Christian the Muslim the atheist the Jew like all of us are one humanity all of us are in the image of God and my responsibility extends beyond Christianity, right? And that actually um, um, is very important for us as, as Christians as well, that, you know, living, you know, at least Coptic Christians and those living in Egypt, um, 
you know, we, we are able to, you know, thankfully and by, by God's grace to be able to extend the Christ's love to others as well, regardless of their background and religion. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, it's not theoretical. No. It's not, who, who's my neighbor? You know, it's, uh, it's very concrete. Whoever God puts in your path, yeah. that's who you must love. Mm. That's who you must help. That's, that's your neighbor. And it's because of him that you could then inherit eternal life. Okay, so you didn't wake up one morning and think to yourself 36 years ago, 86,000 children, here I come, I'm going to help you, right? For those of us who wake up in the morning and we're like, okay, I want to find my neighbor, I want to, I want to do this for Christ. What's that first step? And I'm going to ask you the follow-up, the second hardest step, but the first step I find is the hardest. I know you disagree because before we started here, you said, no, there's a harder step, but you're going to tell everyone about after. But that first step <laughs> yes. where laziness, we're always, you know, tomorrow will come. Tomorrow will come. What is it? Your first step is to take action. Do something. You can give, give of your time, give of your money, give of your energy. Um, uh, Mother Teresa has a lovely saying that she says, you have to give until it hurts, just as Christ gave until mm. it hurt. And so when you're writing that check to the church or to Coptic orphans, and it doesn't hurt, just add a zero. What's another thing you could do? You could sponsor an orphan in Egypt through mm. Coptic orphans. You can go and serve. Uh, through our Surf to Learn program, where you could teach children uh, English there in the south of Egypt. Do something. Yeah. Just as Christ went about doing good. And this is an exercise that I often do with the children and their mothers and in, they are in Egypt. Is I say, decide on doing, uh, tell me something good that you will do. Mm. And it becomes really hard because they go, well, if someone needs help, no, 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 no. Don't start it with if. Mm. Start it with I will and then, and then continue. Um, and it becomes really hard to make a decision to do good. And, it, and after much conversation, they finally get to the part where, okay, I will make pastries for my neighbor. I will go cook for the sick lady that lives down the street. I, the two young girls said that they will go and they will mop the floor for the church to make it sparkle and clean. Yeah. And, and so it's a decision to do good. And it's not hard to start. Just start. We tend to overthink sometimes, right? Yes. I actually remember the story talking about like, you know, just simple actions. Um, again, it was a story like of a meeting in Egypt. Uh, it was a youth meeting. Uh, the, the youth weren't going and whatnot. And all of a sudden, the, like the meeting was booming. Mm. People didn't understand why it was booming. Like nothing changed about the need to make it boom, right? But in reality, there was some guy in the background that used to know Egypt is very dusty. So when he would come and, 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 and clean the dust off the chairs, he would pray oh. and say, God, reveal yourself to the person that will sit on this chair. Oh. God, open the heart. of the So simple. And when the person would sit, you know, the Holy Spirit would work. And next thing you know, the meeting was booming. And such a small action. Also, I learned from one of the youth in church, funny enough, you know, because we, we speak a lot about spiritual canons, do your prayers, do your Bible, all of these things. Um, one of you said, you know, we should have as part of our spiritual canon, like to do one good action on a daily basis, right. you know, to a stranger, like whether it's a homeless person, someone in need, whatever, like, but it's a duty that I have on a daily basis. And I think the good thing about this is that it develops a habit in you and bit by bit, it becomes a part of you, right? And it can grow. So, uh, we tend to overplan, mm -hmm. <laughs> to overthink, mm -hmm. keep it simple. And God will do the rest. Yeah. So when I told you the hardest step is to start, you corrected me right away. And you said, no, that's not the hardest step. What is the hardest step? To keep going. Okay, so great. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you the question. How? How? Through God's grace, through determination, 
Um, be resilient when it comes to doing good. We often are extremely resilient in our careers or in our academic uh, work, uh, but we need to also have that same determination, that same zeal when it comes to doing good. And, and especially for those where they see injustice and it burns their heart mm -hmm. to see such injustice, you cannot leave that. And so with a lot of prayers mm -hmm. and a lot of complaining to God. So tell me about that. The prayer, like what your your actual, you know, experience with prayer, have you found that this is like, you can't have one without the other? Um, your prayers are more like, God, did you see what just happened? Are you <laughs> aware of this is going on? How could you, and why? Because when you're doing this, don't complain to anyone yeah, outside. Social but media. No, yeah. yes, no, complain no social God, media. Yeah. Complain to God all you want. Um, pull, Yanni, throw out all your frustrations to God. Um, ask for wisdom. That's really important. Ask for wisdom. Ask for guidance. Ask for strength. And God will then be give, give you those um, the joy of the small accomplishments, the little things here and there. And then you can't help but begin to thank him for, for such graciousness and for the honor of allowing you to work alongside him. I think mm -hmm. it's the greatest honor that you yeah. could ever have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you, you keep thanking him for how gracious he is mm -hmm. and how kind he is. It's actually such a stark contrast because as you're saying that, I'm thinking social justice in the the worldly view today is just outrage, hatred, yeah. political spectrum, people hating each other because they're lashing out, they're yelling at each other on social media, they're whatever it be. Yet social justice in Christ's heart is get up, go feed the person that's hungry, go mm. clothe the person who's naked. And if you're going to complain, like you're saying, complain to me, yeah. right? That's what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about it. Yell to me. But it's not going to do anything. And I think that's kind of, it, it was like a spark as you're speaking. It kind of just went off. Maybe that is what the problem is in our world today. Why everyone can't stand everyone else. They're arguing about the same problem that probably everyone hates. But no one's actually going to God with it and doing anything. So we're arguing about social justice behind a one thousand dollar phone. Exactly. Right? I, <laughs> I wish it was one thousand. It, it says a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So prayer and 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 striving and as a church, as a congregation, what can we do when we see injustices? What can we do when we're bothered by you know the things that are happening in Egypt? To our brethren. Um, again, it comes to uh, maybe uh, build awareness, understand, uh, begin to think about how we can um, uh, address some of these really difficult questions, like or difficult issues. Um, some of the things that the churches in Egypt have done, and they've done spectacularly, I have to say, in, in terms of addressing poverty. Now, poverty is multifaceted, and there's no one um, silver bullet. Uh, so what the churches have done is they've built schools, they've built the clinics, and they've offered these schools and clinics to the entire community. Now, within the community, there's often strife between the religions, but these schools, these clinics bring together mm. these two polarized communities, and it really uh, provides an immunization from sectarian clashes, uh, potential mm. violence, and that has lasted generations. So this is something that the, the churches have done. And maybe um, something interesting as kind of a, a side note, you know that it was Pope um, Carolus IV uh, who built the first girls' school ever in Egypt. Mm. And this is at a time when girls were not educated. He was well ahead of even the, the country itself, the mm -hmm. government. And he built the first school for girls, beginning to address the injustices against women. Mm -hmm. wow. Can you tell us from your experience also how these projects have brought glory to God. 
how even in a predominantly Muslim country, people see those who help everyone and give glory to Christ, you know? Do you see that often? I see that very often. I see that very often. Um, I was telling Abuna about another, another program that we have where we're bringing together the entire community in uh, girls in this in this community and uh, the the two religions have never come together in a safe space before and one of the things is um they'd say why do they tell us that you are bad mm-hmm. uh, you're you, you guys are are good mm-hmm. and i remember one girl saying as it says in your book you're the salt of the earth. And I thought, oh wow. my goodness, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. Uh, and, and, um, and both the beauty of this project, it's called the Valuable Girl Project. The beauty is the amount of love between them. You could, there's no question. This is the work of the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. because we could not do something like that. And everybody who hears about it says, this is impossible, yeah. but it's being done. And it's, and it's the, to the glory of God. So the word activism sometimes now also has a, a negative ring to it or a negative tone. What's the way that you see us fighting for justice, but doing it in a civil manner, in a, in a, in a Christ-like manner, you know, being not just loud, but respectful at the same time. It's, it's kind of hard to do, you know, it, 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 it's almost like you see protests today as activism, but, they're not very peaceful or they're they're not very you know uh, almost kind to one another the two sides what is the way that you've experienced activism or uh, mother teresa says you know you should always preach the gospel and only on rare occasions use words mm. so it's through it's through action um also the measure of the world is very different than the measure of Christ. Again, it was Mother Teresa. They came to her and they said, <clears throat> you don't have a very successful service. Most of your patients are dying. Um, and she said, God didn't call me to a mm-hmm. successful service. Her service was to give dignity wow. to deep. those who are dying. Wow. That's, That's it. Very deep. Mm-hmm. You were telling us before we started recording again, of how many youth come under your programs and they think they're going to serve, but then they come back and they realize they were the ones that were served. Tell us a bit about that, how we go and we think we're going to save the world, and yet it's Christ coming to save us through little children or through... Yeah, this uh, this program, another program of Coptic Orphans, it's called The 21, and it's named The 21 in honor of the 21 Libyan martyrs. So uh, it's not 21 youth that go, it's uh, it's 100 youth <laughs> that go every year. Um, but uh, countless times uh, I ask, so what was it like? Life-changing experience, life-changing. Tell me why. It says, I've never seen such love. I've never felt so much love there. They, they saw Christ in these children. And children saw Christ in them, mm. um, and um, it's it's um, one of the other uh, one young man. He says, "I mean, there's so much love here. Uh, I've begun to love the flies and to <laughs> love the donkeys." <laughs> and he's telling this to the bishop, and we're like, "Oh, geez, you know." <laughs> but. Um, but this is what uh, what they come back with, and and they realize they what did they offer? You know, yeah. it was the children who changed them, and it was the mothers. They, they often say they have nothing; they it, bare bare floors, etc. And yet the mother goes, "But thank God, thank yeah. God, we have everything we need. Mm-hmm. Thank God, we have nothing." There's another young man. He um, he was telling in the after the home visit they would. Uh, stand up to pray and you know um, he looked around and there was nothing <clears throat> that this little boy can thank god about there's nothing in the house that he could possibly think so he sat and waited to hear what did this boy say to god and so the little boy is praying and he goes and god thank you for the nail that i hang my clothes on mm. the nail 
the nail in the wall that I hang my clothes on. Incredible. Yeah. And, and, and they mean it. Like, this is not a show. Like, this is like very genuine from the depth of their hearts. Like, yes. it cannot, by, by, cannot but touch you. Yeah. It's, uh, I, there was a, uh, a, a lady, and I'll never forget this woman. We went to visit her, <clears throat> and she had four um, uh, disabled children, mentally disabled children, various ages. The eldest one was the least mentally disabled, and so he was the one that made baskets, and they would be living off of what he's making, nothing practically. And I, I remember sitting there, and I looked around, and I didn't see any furniture. And so I said, where do you sleep? And she said, oh, on the cardboard boxes, cardboard boxes. Um, I leaned over to the volunteer rep and I said, you know, maybe we could get her mattresses. And the woman overheard me. She says, what? Me? Mattresses? Why? No, 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 no. What's wrong with the cardboard boxes? Give them to someone in need. What's wrong with the cardboard boxes? Mm. And she insisted to give them to someone in need. So, the widow with the two mates. Like at this point, it's, it's, the, it's the widow with the two mates. Yeah. My blowing. children often would see a show or a movie or something and ask me, Dad, what is rich? How much is money? How much money is yeah. rich? And I'd always try to answer yeah. them and tell them being rich is not having everything, but it's having no need. Mm -hmm. It's not the person mm -hmm. who has everything or can afford everything. It's the person who doesn't need anything. Like, Right. And I feel like that's what you probably see yeah. day in, day out. Yeah. And you probably, I mean, you're visiting, you know, developed nations and you're trying to, you know, gather funds for the for the service. And then you go to where the service is, you probably see more satisfaction and contentment. Yeah. Right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This one, this one woman, when there were Australians that came to visit, she goes, she, her prayer was, wow, my Lord. You brought me people all the way from Australia just for me. Mm. How great you are, O oh Lord. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, Nermin, what is your hope? What is your vision for justice? Or what is your vision for an equitable society? What does that mean? Because that sometimes is a also a difficult debate. Does that mean everyone have the same thing? Does that one... Everyone gets paid the same. Everyone, you know, there's always that argument, you know. What is an equitable society? What is a just society? A just society is where each person goes and does good work and does it with compassion and does it with love. And compassion, of course, the, the root of it is calm and passion passion means suffer and calm is with together and to suffer together that's what suffer. justice is mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. that's what that's the word world that i'm i'm hoping to find where everyone um sees that they are on the path to jericho decide to stop and help decide to do good um and do what they can for their neighbor. The rest is up to God. You just reversed the whole definition, by the way, because because social justice today means my rights. Where are my rights? But what you're saying is, I have responsibilities Abilities. towards the other, right? Which is so beautiful. Yeah, it's always me, me, me for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And are you hopeful? Are you hope? Are you seeing it? Is it becoming more difficult? I see it all the time. I see it everywhere. I'm always thrilled and so much more that's, God is just wonderful. Yes, mm -hmm. I see it. <laughs> and do you, because we feel almost sometimes like a guilt, but there is no resentment on the part of those in need, which is, I always found incredible. It's not like they resent us or they no. resent, you know, the, the richer nations or those who have everything. I feel like they, they're more loving than we can ever be. We learn a lot from, yeah, especially those that we've run into in Egypt. Hmm. An incredible lesson for us. But yeah, 
we we will be asked, you know, what did you do with your wealth? Did you share your wealth? Mm-hmm. Did you stop and help the the man? So um, I would often think, you know, the last thing that I want is when God says, you know, we brought you to America from Egypt. We gave I gave you all of this success, and what did you do? Yeah. And I say, God, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed the luxuries and, and the riches. Mm. I don't think that's the answer <laughs> that mm. I need mm-hmm. to be saying. I think the reality is that we are the ones who are poor and we are the ones who are in need of them. We are not yes. the ones who are in need of us. And if our if our mindsets and our hearts are, are in heaven and with Christ, you know, trying to live a true Christian life, I think this becomes more and more a reality and again a responsibility. Mm. St. John Chrysostom uh, says, um, the poor man is indebted to you for a piece of bread, but you are indebted to him for your salvation. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Every time, every time we do a podcast, there's a, a St. John Chrysostom quote yeah. that ruins yeah. my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> Sounds about right. That makes me not sleep for the next uh, <laughs> last podcast. Exactly. Father. Father, uh, Father Anthony's like he who has two pairs of shoes while his brother is walking naked is a thief. Uh, I yes. have to go home and uh, look at my closet <laughs> yes. and cry a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Before we wrap it up, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to tell us if there's, um, or not if there, but about the different kind of causes or you know the things that we can help out with. Absolutely. Um, uh, with Coptic Orphans, you can sponsor a child. And this is one of the most beautiful relationship. You get to see their photo. You get to see their progress over the years. You don't have to worry about uh, writing in Arabic because everything is translated and we we translate all the letters back and forth. If ever that you go to Egypt, you can go and visit your child. So this is something I highly encourage people uh, to do, and especially if they have young children, because when you're raising your child with uh, your sponsored child, and they know that they have a brother in in Egypt, um, it puts a seed that you see the fruit, and I've actually seen the fruit, where I've asked people, you know, uh, someone like you, Paul, and say, well, how did you hear about Coptic orphans? And they say, my father uh, used to sponsor a child, and mm. I remember getting the letters when I was a little kid. That's how I remember and such. So um, the seed stays with you. So this is one one way. The um, other me for for but again, but is it really like something that they could do to go visit that child? And, yes, yes, you yeah, can go and visit. Absolutely, absolutely. We mm-hmm. arrange everything. So no matter where they are in Egypt, we make sure to get you from point A to point B. Wow. And um, one little girl knew that her sponsor was coming to visit. So she tells her volunteer rep, she says, uh, Mr. Akmal, you have to take me to the hairdresser. Oh. I mean, my sponsor is coming oh. today. I mean, for her, it was like like a, a going to a wedding. You know, I have to prepare her, uh, mm. and such. That's how excited that they are to see to see their sponsors. And what does the sponsor do, if you can tell everyone? The sponsor commits to a monthly donation of $100 mm. every every month. Um, they then should write to them at least once or twice in, in the year. And it could be simple as I'm praying for you or happy birthday, something as simple as that. Um, and that's basically, that's the commitment. What, what does it cover for that child or what? The- that covers that the child stays in our program and has the benefits of everything that we do, the training that we give, the make sure the lessons are paid for make sure that he gets the mentoring and guidance that he needs all the way to till he graduates from university or at the highest levels that he can. Mm-hmm. And the basic needs, uh, like if they're in an impoverished area, that just to clarify, like that, that's all provided. All covered, right? all mm-hmm. covered. Yes. And they can also give like uh, extra, right, on their birthdays, Christmas, things like that. Yes, right? Which is, where, yeah, I need mean, that to an extra amount yeah. uh, because the, the sponsorship amount goes into the pool, for a, a general pool, and each family is based on their circumstances or given based on their circumstances. But that gift for Christmas or for Easter, the entire thing goes directly to the child. Mm. He decides mm. what he wants to do with it, buy a bike or mm. save it or... 
whatever he likes. And, and if someone drops out of sponsoring someone, it, you never lose touch with that. You, you still continue with that can, child. They, they Absolutely. Yeah. Because we use the, the, the pool, pool exactly. fund again. So once they're with you, they're with you until they graduate. Yeah. From, Absolutely. From one of the things that I really loved when I went with the 21 this summer is, is I saw how organized uh, everything was. It, it was so mind-blowing to me to see this happening in Egypt. Uh, also, I, I really enjoyed to see how the volunteer reps knew the families inside out. They're like, like another, they were a father to them, a brother to them. Like, it was really incredible. And, and one of the stories that really touched me, that, like, it shows the proactiveness of the organization is that Although it seems so simple, but to me, like it meant a lot. There was um, th this uh, young child uh, whose dad passed away. He only had his mother, uh, but his mother was, you know, gaining weight. So, so Coptic orphans offered for the mother a gym membership, <laughs> which which sounds silly, but it's it's actually not silly at all. It's quite proactive because what happens if his mother passes away because of her lack of health? So that proactiveness, that 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 vision, like I don't, made me fall in love. Honestly, uh, may God bless you and reward you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we've got the the volunteer reps. I remember one calling me midnight. I was in Egypt at the time, calling me in midnight, and he goes, "My son passed his exam. My son, his son, meaning mm -hmm. the child in the in the program. Mm -hmm. He's going to be an engineer. He's going to go mm -hmm. into engineering university mm -hmm. or whatever." Midnight. He couldn't wait <laughs> to tell us. So tell people because I don't think people know that how it works. You have volunteers who are each responsible for how many did you say? Twenty to thirty children. So you have volunteers that are responsible for twenty, thirty children. They they do everything with them. They help them with tutoring. They they take them to church. Even they do all that yes. stuff. And then these volunteers, you said they have. Their own leaders, right? Correct, correct. Who are also volunteers? The their leaders are then staff members. Okay. That provide and help uh, facilitate whatever problems that they may have and monitor the spending and make sure that everything is done correctly. Logistics and administrate all that. Uh, yes, stuff. Uh, yes. So it's a it's a big operation, a really big operation, but it's um, done extremely professional. Uh, uh, all our country finances are audited. So there's audited financial statements for the five countries that we operate in. Um, there's review. There's um, It's done in a way to make sure that we get the greatest impact with the least dollars. Do you have anything that either of you wanted to add? I'm good. You? I'm good. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. I think in conclusion, and, and we were just blessed today that we have Nermeen with us on behalf of Coptic Orphans, but whatever it be, our church is blessed. I mean, we have in, in St. George's Church, we have St. Joseph's Association, we have associations in in Africa, and Kenya, and uh, Tanzania, and Bolivia, and even here at home, I think that the, the thing that we came out with is there's no Christ without my brother mm. and sister, and that there is no social justice without christ and that this zeal is not just it shouldn't just be a zeal but it should be a way of life that there is yeah. no eternal life without it mm. uh god bless you Nermeen. thank you so much thank for your you, time Paul. thank you father as thank usual you, thank, thank you, you all father, for joining Nermeen. us today